Uh, I guess I'll start by asking also if there are any questions on PA5, which is due Thursday. Uh, I think we're implementing a tree uh, that does sort of a map-like thing uh, for Thursday. The website is back up. Um, it just came fully back up yesterday. So videos from last week are still not posted. Assignment five. Um, right, writing a symbol table uses a tree um, to provide a map slash dictionary interface using generics. Um, and I talked about pretty much everything involved in doing that last class uh, when we talked about trees. Um, Everything else is just basically so that we can actually use this tree. Uh, so that we can build a simple table based on uh, the sample programs. And at this point, the first program that I posted, uh, uh, what was it, loop 210 or print, print 210, something like that. Uh, print 1, 2, 10. That, that program should run on your interpreter, and it should uh, it won't actually do the printing 1 to 10, because we haven't gotten quite that far yet. But it will run that program with no issues whatsoever. Uh, the only thing we haven't implemented yet is the jump instructions, which are necessary to do the actual looping part. Uh, so the program will actually end up printing out either 1 or 10, I forget which. Uh, whatever this loop 1 to 10 printed out when it was run. I think it printed out 10. So the program should still print out 10. Uh, Let's make sure. Where's the print? Print. Load I. So, no, it should print out one. Uh, that's the only thing it should do. Because what you're implementing for this, this program is the addition of uh, store and load with uh, text as the operand uh, instead of just integers. Um, questions on that? Does everyone feel like they have a good direction for what, what we're trying to accomplish with PA5? Do I take silence to mean yes? You have a confused look on your face, Dan. Ooh, once you start, you're not supposed to admit to the instructor that you haven't started the homework yet. Okay. Um, as usual, I do respond to emails. Uh, no guarantees after, I'd say, 8 p.m. Uh, usually I do, but after 10 p.m., I won't get to it until the morning. Um, right, so today we're going to talk more about trees. Uh, on last Thursday, we talked about the mechanics of trees, how they work, what they what they looked like, um, how they were structured, what advantages that gave us. Are there any questions on any of that? Cool. 
So today we're going to talk about two very specific types of trees. Those are heaps and bee trees. Uh, who wants to tell me what a heap is? Nick, do you want to start us off? What's a heap? A heap. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's the first sentence of the third paragraph of the chapter. You do have your book with you, right? Okay. You did read the chapter, though. Let me down. Okay. A heap... According to the chapter, a heap is a binary tree in which the elements can be compared with each other using total order semantics. And a few sentences later adds on to that as to how that's used. Uh, we used a binary search tree, or we built a, actually we built a, a, a ternary search tree uh, last class, and we used total order semantics. I didn't call it that, but that's what we used. The idea that the elements related to each other with some greater than or less than relation. Uh, in that case, the left everything in the left child had a value less than the, the thing in the root node, and everything in the right child had a value greater than the thing in the root node, or greater than or equal to. We have to draw the line somewhere. Uh, a heap is similar but slightly different. Instead of being uh, the left side, basically the left side of the tree being the, the low end of the tree, and the right hand side being the high end of the tree, a heap has the largest, the ones with the greatest value, the elements, the largest elements up at the top. So the largest element in a heap is its root node. And everything gets lower from there. Um, and another property that it exhibits is that it's balanced. And that's one of the things that the chapter mentions in the third sentence of the chapter. Uh, both heaps and bee trees operate on balanced trees. Uh, and last class I mentioned that the efficiency of trees is directly related to their depth. Uh, so having a balanced tree where everything is pretty much at the same depth means that everything has exactly the same efficiency. You really can't get any more efficient than that. Well, without having one part of the tree be very efficient and another part of the tree be very inefficient, which overall me means uh, lower efficiency. Um, and the book uses the example of a priority queue for heaps. Uh, we didn't really talk in depth about priority queues. Uh, they're basically queues that instead of just being uh, first in, first out, they have some priority associated with each element in it. And things with a higher priority kind of skip ahead spaces. So the highest priority things are always at the, be at the head of the queue. Uh, it's like uh, you're waiting to go into a, a, some, some event and the president is also going to the event. The president obviously gets priority. He goes right in. You're still waiting. Uh, that's essentially how a priority queue works. And it turns out that a heap is a very good uh, kind of uh, manipulation mechanism. It's not really the storage mechanism. It's the manipulation mechanism uh, to implement a priority queue. Uh, so... There are two rules for heaps mentioned at, at the very beginning of the chapter. Uh, and they're the two things that, I, that I've already mentioned, but they are very important. Without these two rules, you don't have a heap. The, the A node is always greater than or equal to its children. Uh, the overall tree is both... Is, is a complete tree, and it is a binary tree, 
each node has two child nodes, or zero or one. Uh, but we're not going to try implementing a, a ternary heap. That would just, it wouldn't work. Uh, a heap is very specifically a binary tree. Uh, and because we want it to be balanced, the easiest way to do that is to enforce completeness. So that means that every level at depth of 0, 1, 2, however deep this tree is, every level has all the nodes it can possibly have, except maybe the last one, in which all of those elements are shoved over to the left. Um, so let's take a look at how, how the mechanics of heaps work. Uh, so I'm going to start with this example on page All right, so that's that's where the book starts off, and you can see that this is a complete binary. It, it's it's a binary tree. No arguing about that. It is complete. This this level can only have one node, and it has one. This level can only have two nodes, and it has two. Four, and it has four. And this one is not full, so the tree is not full, but it is complete. Uh, and with this number of nodes, it, this tree is as balanced as it can possibly be. Uh, sure, this node could be over here, but and that would be symmetric, but it doesn't affect whether or not it's balanced. Uh, balance just means we can't have this whole cluster be somewhere over here. Uh, and we can see that it, it follows the same two rules uh, for heaps. So it's a complete binary, binary tree. And every node is greater than or equal to its child nodes. 45 is greater than both 35 and 23. 35 is greater than its children. 23 is greater than its children. 27 is greater than its children. Everything else is a leaf node. It doesn't have any children. Uh, but as with most data structures, having a static cluster of data is not very interesting. Uh, and with heaps, we're interested in adding and removing. Uh, so if we were implementing a priority queue, this would be akin to pushing and popping. Uh, so, but when, with normal trees, we can't just add. With normal trees, we can just add, and we don't have to do anything else. Uh, unless we specifically enforce that things be sorted, uh, that things be in a certain order, enforce other rules. Uh, in a heap, we do enforce other rules. So we can't just add something uh, anywhere. Uh, with the binary search tree that or with the binary search tree that we implemented uh, last class, uh, we could start at the top and figure out which side of the tree it should go on. Then look at the next node, or the, the root node of that subtree, and figure out which side of that node it should go on, and continue doing that until we find a place where we can stick a leaf node. Uh, with this representation, that's not going to work. Uh, because all we have is, let's say we're adding, uh, the book's example is 42. We're adding 42. 42 is less than 45, but we have two choices. We could put it either of these two places. Uh, 
that's not always going to be the case. For instance, if we picked uh, 32, uh, it could not go down here because 23 is less than 32. It would have to be above 23. But 35 is greater than 32, so we could send it down this subtree. Either way, that gets messy and doesn't really work out very well. Uh, so the easiest thing to do is to focus on we have to satisfy both rules. So we pick one, satisfy that rule first, and then worry about how we're going to satisfy the other one. So we start with this complete binary tree idea. Uh, it's a binary tree. When we implement this, it's going to be implemented specifically as a binary tree with one piece of data and two pointers to other nodes. Well, we're actually not going to implement it quite that way, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, but there won't be any any question that this is a binary tree. We can't not make this a binary tree. Um, so how do we make this continue to be complete? What's the next available um, slot in this tree that would still make it be complete? Dion. Left slot under 21. Yes. It doesn't really look like the left slot, but it is. Um, but now we have the issue of, of this other rule. The other rule says that each node will be greater than or equal to its child nodes. Uh, 21 is not greater than 42. It's not equal to 42. Uh, so it doesn't satisfy that condition. So uh, we really have two steps here. The first one is just add it in the next available slot. The second part is something called reheapification. Yes, that's a made-up word. But that's what it's called. Um, Reheapification. Basically what that means is changing around the order of things so that everything has the proper... Uh, that, that total order is, is, is maintained. Um, and basically what it means is we know that this is the, uh, the node we just added. In the book, it's, it's, it has a gray tint to it. Uh, if we know its parent, we can compare it to its parent. If they're in the right order, we can leave them the same, we're done. If they're not in the right order, we have to swap them. So that means that 42 should go up here and 21 should come down here. And I'll make this one kind of fuzzy, so we know that it's the one we're adding. Um, do we have a heap? We do not. We do not have a heap. Um, so now we know that the one we're adding is in this spot, and we know that its parent is here. We can compare those two, and since it's not a heap we know we need to swap them. Actually, the reverse is true. Since this is less than this element, we know that it's not a heap and we need to swap them. So, let's do that. That's a three. What about now? Do we have a heap? Lynn, do we have a heap? We do have a heap. Why do we have a heap? What What would we check to ensure that it's in the right order? Based on what we've done to get to that point. Correct. Um... And if you look at the middle of page 524, uh, basically the steps we went through are the pictures on page 523. 
the picture on page 524 is exactly what we have here. Um, the book refers to all these numbers as priorities because it's using the priority queue example. Um, that's one instance where heaps are useful. I can't think of any other instances off the top of my head, but a heap by itself doesn't have to be a priority queue. These could just be values. Uh, one Actually, I can think of the use of heaps off the top of my head. Um, in order to uh, put this in sorted order, this this mess, uh, this is obviously the greatest element. And these come next, and these come next, and these come next. So you're bunch of elements is mostly sorted into chunks. Uh, and there is actually a sorting method built off of that concept that is called heap sort. Uh, obviously, if we were going to actually put it in sorted order, this would go at the end. These would have to be flipped. Uh, these we'd have to do some, some sorting of. And these are would have to kind of get mixed in. So it's not completely sorted by itself, uh, but there is some some general order to it. The, the top has higher values than, than the bottom. And uh, we can see this um, when we start removing elements. Uh, so it really doesn't matter what element we remove. Uh, but the book, since the book is using the example of a priority queue, there's only one element that it makes sense to remove, and that's the, the top element, the one that would be at the front of the line, the president going into the event. Uh, so basically that means that 45 ends up over here, off in its own little world. Uh, and is no longer in the heap. Um, so the question becomes, how do we turn this back into a tree, back into a heap, make sure it's a heap, and still not have 45 in it? Um, and it turns out that the easiest way to do this is to put this last element up at the beginning. Because once we do that, it is still that is the only way to take this tree and turn it back into a complete binary tree. Do we have a heap? We do not have a heap. Why don't we have a heap? Correct. Um, What do you suggest we do to fix that? I'm not not worried about the values, just the general concept. Reheapification, exactly. Um, so when we add elements and things kind of bubble upward, that's called reheapification upward. And this, what we're going to do here, is reheapification downward. So instead of starting at the element we've added, we're going to start at the root and kind of go down. Uh, so This node is obviously much larger, or, yes, it's, 21 is obviously much larger than 42. Uh, 21 is obviously much smaller than 42, um, and it's a little bit smaller than 23. Uh, 
So we, we have to do some swapping here. Uh, we could swap 21 or 23, and that would satisfy that relationship. But then we'd have the issue of 23 would still be smaller than 42. So instead of arbitrarily picking a, a child node to swap with, we swap with the largest child node because out of the three nodes, that's the biggest. Uh, so that should be the root of that, that tiny triangle. So we put 42 up here and 21 down there. And do we have a heap? Do we have a heap? Sorry, the numbers are a little bit hard to see. Uh, 42, 21, 23, 27, 35, 22, 4, 19, 5. Yes. No, we do not have a heap. We're close, but we don't quite have a heap because 21 is still smaller than both of its children. Okay. Um, so out of 21, 27, and 35, the largest is 35. The largest, so the largest child is 35. We'll swap with that. And And now for the easy question. Is this a heap? Yes, this is a heap. Because one, we can't go any further. And two, technically 21 is larger than it, both of its children. Yes? Um, so if you did, like, put 23 instead of 42, like, you can do things to change that around, but then it wouldn't look like that. So, so you're saying, is there only one way to put a bunch of numbers into a heap. Um, so, uh, let's see, what that looked like, oh geez, I don't remember what that looked like anymore. 35. 35 was here, 42 was here? No. 42, 35, and you're saying put um, the 23 here and the 21 here? So, um, yes, we could get a, another valid heap from this. The problem with that is that then we'd have, uh, for one, we, we haven't solved the problem. We still have the problem here. Um, and we have, uh, we, we have another problem here. We can swap 22 and 21. So 22 goes there, 21 goes there. And that side of the tree is okay. But we still have to fix this problem. So 23 would end up here. Um, and then we'd have to make a choice there. Um, so 23 could end up down here. Uh, the difference there is basically 21 and 23 are in opposite locations. If we put 23 over here, um, we could do that, but 27 would end up here, 23 would end up here, 21 would end up there. They do kind of a, a three-way swap. And I think th those are the only three possible reheapifications. But it wouldn't be they're both, they're, All three of them are valid heaps because they, they satisfy both conditions. Um, one of them is just far easier to implement, far easier to check for, um, and it kind of, it, it's, it's mathematically provable easily. Uh, basically by saying that out of three elements, if I pick the largest to be up at the top, then it, sat it that sub-problem, that smaller problem, automatically satisfies rule number one of heaps, and if I do that, working my way down the chain, solving each small sub-problem, I am guaranteed to have a 
a, a correct solution. Uh, and that's so uh, sneak peek into how heap sort works. Uh, it treats this this uh, mass of numbers as a heap, turns it into a heap, and then then treats it as a queue. Pops off the the root node, puts it in the first slot or the last slot, for instance. Uh, Reheapifies, then pops off the top node, puts that in the next slot. Reheapifies, does that again until there are no nodes in the heap, and then you have a sorted array. Uh, this is called a max heap because the node at the top has has the maximum value in the entire heap. There's also something called a min heap, which is the reverse. It has the smallest element at the top. Um, so to do heap sort, it probably makes more sense to have a min heap because then you can take the top element, put it at the beginning of the array, reheapify, take the next element, put it in the next slot in the array, so on and so forth. Um, so uh, questions on heap mechanics. Those are basically the important things, adding and removing and reheapifying. Um, So now comes the question of how should we store the elements in the heap? We've seen the the first introduction to trees was that we can use an array to store the data in a tree because there are relationships between the index of a particular node and its parent and child nodes. And we've also seen a a, a class that represents a tree node that points to its children. So what, what do we think is the most efficient storage mechanism, or the best storage mechanism for a heap? This is actually one of the um, self-test exercises on page 527. Gives the answer. It is an array. Um, and let's see what answer, what, why, why the book thinks that's a good way. I have an opinion as to why, why that's a good way, but a, a good way, but I want to see if the book agrees with me. The book's explanation is, because a heap is a complete binary tree. Okay. In the previous chapter... The book mentioned that an array is a very convenient way to store a complete binary tree because you can say this is element 0, this is element 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and you don't have to worry about elements in the middle of nowhere that don't have any values. Uh, the fact that it's a binary tree, uh, in fact, as long as you set how many children every node has uh, and enforce that it's a complete binary tree, you can store it in an array and use those relationships. Binary is very easy because log base 2 is relatively easy to compute. Um, no, not log base 2. Dividing by 2 is relatively easy to count. Um, so here we'd have an, ar an array of size 9 right now, ignoring the 45. This is at index 8. Uh, subtract 1, get 7, divide by 2, get 3, and that is the index of this node. So we don't have to do a whole lot of work to find the parent for the reheapification upward. Um, whereas if we used, um, they just call it a linked structure, um, a class that represents a node that points to other nodes, uh, we'd have to have some way of discovering what node represented the parent of a particular node. Uh, that's very difficult because links aren't bidirectional unless we specify them that way. So having an array gives us the ability to say what node is my parent very easily. Um, 
That's the answer that I would give to that question. It makes programming easier. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk about B trees, um, and then I'm going to implement a heap. Uh, B trees are another uh, thing you can do with trees. Um, despite the B, it has absolutely nothing to do with a binary tree. B trees are not binary. Uh, in fact, one of the things that the book mentions is that B trees generally have uh, an arity of several hundred. So each node has several hundred child nodes. Uh, basically, a, a, a way similar to how we implemented it with the, the ternary tree. Uh, we have a bunch of data and then n, n pieces of data in a node and n plus one trees, subtrees. Uh, and this means that basically uh, any amount of data can be put in a B tree and it will always be complete, full, balanced. Uh, everything will end up at the same level. Uh, or all the leaf nodes will be at the same level. Um, B trees are often used for databases because they're very quick. Uh, there aren't a lot of levels to step through, uh, and you can do some clever searching on them. Uh, so it, it's not like taking uh, all of your data and storing it in a, a large array that you enforce is sorted and then trying to search through it. Uh, using a B tree as an index into a database to search through is a lot quicker than even trying to do binary search on it. Um, so, um, that's the main thing about B trees. There, because of, because there are potentially many pieces of data and potentially many child subtrees, there are some interesting things that you need to do when adding or removing mainly adding, um, because the appropriate way to add to a, a B tree is take a node, uh, kind of the, um, the approach that we used with the ternary tree to figure out which node it should go into. Uh, and with the ternary tree, we said, if there is enough room in this node, stick it in this node. Determine which node it belongs in, uh, which subtree it belongs in. If there is enough room in this node, stick it in this node. If not, make a new subtree with this, this element in it. Um, B trees work very similarly, except we can actually put uh, one more than the maximum number of elements that we can put in a node in there temporarily. Uh, and then once we do that, we kind of break this node into two nodes and make a, a new, a new subtree, uh, except the middle node in the nodes that we have available to us, the middle element in that node jumps up to the, the parent node, and then we do the process all over again. And it's only at the top level if we end up with more elements in this node. So if we have an arity of 200 and we have 201 elements in this root node, we split it in two and make the root node have the middle value and everything else has 100 elements in it. Uh, in practice, I've never actually encountered writing a B tree. There are some very good implementations. Like I mentioned before, they're called databases. Um, so I'm not going to go too much in detail. Uh, if you're interested, I recommend reading the book. Um, but the information you need for the exam is kind of higher level 
conceptual stuff. Heaps, on the other hand, are very cool. And that means we're going to do an example using heaps in 35 minutes, it looks like. So, in order to create a heap, we need a tree. So let's start making something that looks like a tree. Um, we need some data. Mm. Let's genericize this. Data. I've done the Brent Spiner joke in here, right? Okay. Um, since it's an array and it won't necessarily have the same size as the number of elements that we have in this heap, we should keep track of how many elements are actually valid in this array. So. We'll keep track of that. Um, let's give this a constructor where we can specify an initial size. And let's also uh, implement an ensure capacity method immediately so that we don't don't have to implement it later so we can use it. Uh, and it's going to look exactly like the ensure capacity of uh, every other data structure that we've written using an array to this point. So new size if new size let's do that. Let's enter equal to data. This is only going to have one statement, so turn. Uh, otherwise, we need to build a new array. So, uh, object bigger array equals new object of size new size. Now we need to copy everything from. data into a bigger array. So, system array. Copy. From data starting at zero to bigger array starting at zero with size elements. And now we can say data should point to bigger array. Right. I think that looks reasonable. So Let's um, 
start by writing an add method. You don't want to use that compare to method. So E needs to be comparable. What am I doing? Public void. Add E element. What's the first thing I should do inside this add method? Nick, what should I do first inside this add method? I should. Um, what what should I use as the argument to ensure capacity? That's really all I need. Um, in general, um, it's usually a good idea to allocate much more space than you, you actually need. Uh, uh, but I think that should probably end up being in this method. So to kind of hide it from everything else. So that when we say ensure capacity some size, uh, it makes more sense as an English sentence. I want to make sure I have enough space for this many elements. However many elements I actually have, I really don't care. But I need enough space for this many elements. So we'll change this to new size times two. Um, so we'll first ensure capacity, ensure that we have enough space to stick this element. Um, What's the next thing I should do? Dion. Hmm? So the, everything in this add method is different from the add method for trees because we're, we're following those two rules on page... Uh, it doesn't have a page number. 521, the first page of the chapter. And I mentioned that we're going to start with the second one and create a complete binary tree first, and then worry about um, making sure that each node is greater than or equal to its children. So where am I going to put this this element? Not node, add element. Lynn, you have an answer for this? Where am I going to put the element in the array? So where where did I put it in in the demo? Right, so if we're treating that tree as an array, where in the array is that? Yes. And I already have something that points to the what will be the next index in the array, and what is that? I already have something that has the value of the next available index in the array. What is that? It's just size. Because uh, if I have an array of size 
50. It really doesn't matter. 523. And I have 10 elements in there. They fill indexes 0 through 9, but size is still 10. 10 points to the next available index in the array. So if I say data, uh, size equals element. And now size no longer points to the next available in the index in the array, so I should increment that. And now, now we have to reheapify. And we have to reheapify upward. So I'm actually going to put that increment of size as the last thing in the method. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is because I want reheapify upward to take an argument. That argument represents the element that I want to reheapify upward. So I'm specifying the index that I just filled. Uh, and can anyone guess why I'm doing that? It starts with an R. Comes from the same Latin root as does cursive and current and recursion. I'm going to use recursion. Uh, if I and IDX. Um, okay, so stopping conditions. There are a couple that I can think of. What are some of the stopping conditions? If we're at the root, we're done. We can't reheapify upward any further. How did we say I compute the parent index? Okay, uh, what else is a stopping condition? So if my parent is already greater than I am, I don't need to go any further. I'm done. And those are the only two stopping conditions. I believe. So if I'm not stopping, uh, what should I do? We've already determined that uh, actually we should we should follow the rules explicitly, if the parent is greater than or equal to the current node, we're done. Uh, however, if the parent is less than, we still need to reheapify. We need to swap. So, how do we swap? Jack, how do we swap?
Right. Okay. And what's the last thing to do? Right. I think I'm actually going to disagree with myself for that one. Um, I think we can convert these two string methods that we used last time into uh, something that we, we can use with arrays. So instead of root here, we'll say zero, that'll be the starting index. Or the the node index. We'll call it the node index. So this will also be an int. This will be a node index. Um, if node idx is greater than size, return nothing. Um, otherwise return what is it node idx times two plus one get rid of that extra stuff because this is only a binary tree and this should be node idx times two plus two This should be data node IDX, and I think that should work. Let's find out. Public class heat test. Public static void name string args um, heap integer we like ints um, my heap equals new heap integer uh, let's say 20 my heap that add uh, let's let's see what this heap comes up with uh, 21. Actually, let me not copy that, the one that's on the board. Let me copy the one from the book. So this should be 45. 35. 23. Note that all of this will not actually test the reheapify stuff.
but it should give me exactly the same heap as is in the book. And now I'm going to add 42 and if we did everything right we should get exactly the same thing as the book gets. So compile, yes, save that. What is it complaining about? Aha, yes, greater than or equal to cannot be applied to objects. And it turns out that even object does not have a compare to method. So, um, what we're actually going to do is since this stores something uh, that is comparable, we're going to use comparable as the type of the array. Which means that here we need to use that as well. And here. Um, comparable is an interface, so you can't actually create instances of it, but you can create new arrays that use that as the element type. I forgot one place. And it, now it's complaining it's not a boolean. Yeah. Uh, in order, we work. Uh, the parent, the parent element. We're testing if it's greater than or equal to this this other thing, which means that compared to will return one or zero, if that's true. So, uh, greater than greater than or equal to zero should do the same thing. What do we have going on here? Found object, yes. Uh, comparable. Okay. And Yes, we have an uh, we have a warning. But that should be okay. We should still be able to run this. And let's see if it makes sense. Um So somehow I, I still have something printing out no, I don't know where that came from. Uh, but we start out 45 at the top, then we have 35, uh, 35 on one side that has children of uh, 27 and 21, yes, and then we have 19 and 5 descending from 27, that looks right, um, 23 on the other side with 22 and 4 descending from it. That looks right. Uh, after we add 42, we still have 45 at the top. That is correct. We have 42 at the top of its left subchild, and 23 as the top of its other child. This, in fact, this side of the tree doesn't change at all. It's still 45, 23, 22, and 24. Over here, uh, the 35 has moved down, 
and has a child, and it's a subtree of 42, and the other side of that is a subtree with 27 at the root and 19 and 5 below it, which is exactly the same thing that the book gets. Um, That should fix that. Off by one error. Yep, that looks better. Okay, so now let's implement a remove method. Uh, questions on, on our add method first. Okay, so in keeping with the, um, the way the book does things, uh, we're going to pretend this is a priority queue, and the only thing that we have the option of removing is the thing at the very the, the, the root node, the thing at the very top of the uh, the heap. So the first thing we should do is, uh, well, ideally we'd want to return the uh, the the root node and then do some reheapifying. Java doesn't work that way, so we have to get that first node, do our reheapification, and then return that node. Right, so that's that's why we have 45 over here, because we're kind of holding on to it until we're done with the reheapification. So, comparable temp equals data zero. Uh, that should be a P. What's next? What did we say the next the next step was, uh, Clark? So I've just removed, or I'm in the process of removing this root node. So now this this first array index is invalid. Um, how am I going to basically shift everything down one and still maintain the heapness? Make sure that it stays a heap. Uh, we will in a minute, but before I do that, I need to turn this into a, a complete binary tree. So that, when I did the example on the board, I basically erased this root node. Yikes! A whole combination of that. Um, so, uh, I had a tree, and I took out the root node. So I can't just shift the tree into each other, because that's not going to work. Um, the... What did I mention that the, um, the book strategy was, was to do? So, the, we could do that. Um, the problem with that is that it's kind of inefficient, and it's a lot... The, the trend with trees is that it's a lot more efficient to do the least amount of moving around possible. So, we take this, the last element of the array and stick it in front. We know that it's going to be a completely incorrect heap. It's not going to be a valid heap. So that's why we do the reheapification process afterwards. So, 
Uh, actually, at this point, we should be decrementing size because we're removing something. At, at, after line 28 executes, size will point to the last valid position in the array. So that line 29 will move the last valid element in the array to the beginning. Questions on that? And now we can reheapify, but we don't want to reheapify upward because we don't want any elements bubbling up toward the beginning of the array, uh, up toward the top of the heap. But we want this uh, this new root element to bubble down to where it's supposed to go. So we'll call reheapify downward and. Just like reheapify upward, we will pass an index, except the index of the element we're trying to fit in is currently zero. That's our starting point. So now, And we're going to use recursion again. So we should, we, we, we have similar stopping conditions to um, reheapify upward. Except instead of determining if the index we're going to is um, or if, if the index, the current index is zero, we want to discover if the index that we're that we would be comparing to is outside the, the bounds of the array. So if And we're really interested in um, if the, the left child is outside the bound of, bounds of the array. Because if the right child is outside of the bounds of the array, it's still possible that this node has a left child that we would compare against. Um, so if, what would that be? IDX times 2 plus 1 is its left child. greater than or equal to size, greater than or plus. No, greater than or equal to size. Return. Because we're done at this point. Um, the other option is that um, This uh, that this element is already greater than both of its children. So, if um, data, and we'll we'll keep the comparisons the same. So, we'll use that greater than or equal to if data idx dot compare to greater than or equal to zero. Um, we want to make sure not only is it greater than its left child, we want to make sure it's greater than its right child as well. And 
Did I add UX dot compare to data ID X times two plus two greater than or equal to zero greater than or equal to zero. Um A potential problem is that uh, the value of data at that point is uh, null. That's okay because comparing anything to something that's null results in uh, positive one. Anything is greater than nothing. Uh, the other problem that might crop up is that IDX times 2 plus 2 is something that is beyond the bounds of the array. Uh, so we do need to watch out for that. So I'm actually going to, this is getting kind of messy at this point, but First, we're going to say if the uh, the left child is less than or equal to, uh, then we're good so far. Uh, but if the right child either doesn't exist or is less than, that still satisfies that second half of the condition. So we have kind of a short circuiting or here, uh, or data IDX Squat two plus two. Uh, no, not even that. Not even checking the data. If that is greater than or equal to data dot length, or this other thing. Missing a parenthesis somewhere. Yes, I am. There we go. Um, it's probably advisable to take IDX flat two plus two and IDX flat two plus one and store them in variables like left index and right index, so that these comparisons don't get so messy. So why don't we do that? Int left IDX equals IDX flat two plus two int right IDX equals IDX flat two plus let's get those correct. There we go. Um, now this should be left IDX. This should be right IDX this should be left IDX no this should be right IDX and what are we going to do if that whole mess is true we're done Otherwise, we do a swap kind of like this and pull over heapify downward on the appropriate child. So we have to figure out, um, let's say, int dust idx equals left idx. Assume it's the left child unless proven otherwise. Uh, if data left IDX, no, if data right IDX that compared to data left IDX is greater than or equal to zero. That means that the right child is the largest value. Uh, which means that dist IDX should equal right 
IDX. So now we know which index we're going to swap with. We can pretty much copy and paste our swap code. Mm. There we go. Copy and paste our swap code. Except this is dust IDX. This is dust IDX. And now instead of reheapifying upward on parent index, we should reheapify downward on what? Now let's check for any potential uh, array index out of bounds exception opportunities. Uh, there is only one remaining, and it is right here. I'm going to do exactly the same thing that I did here. And that should all work. So we'll go back to heap test. My heap dot remove and print it out. Compile. What did I? Oh. Oh yes. We should actually return that element, shouldn't we? Casting it, because that's unchecked cast, yes. Oh, geez. What is that annotation? Is it opening it? Hmm? Yeah, is that is that what it is? Suppress warnings or warblings. Warnings. Unchecked. On and that's the same. warnings we had before. I could use the same annotation, but I'm lazy. Done. And we should get a picture similar to what we got. Page. Five twenty five, I think. So forty two is at the top. 23, 22, 24, yes, that's still the same. 35, 21, 27, 19, 5. Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. All right. Um, questions on heaps? Cool. Um, I ran 10 minutes over. We'll take a 10 minute break, come back at 3.15, and um, this is kind of a lull. So you're welcome to ask me questions about homeworks. You're welcome to work on the homework. Um, I'll hang out for a bit, 
so you can ask me questions, and we'll go from there. Uh, next class, we'll talk about, I don't know what we're talking about. We're talking about searching next class. Yes, we're talking about searching next class. So, fun stuff.